Welcome to the Vita Dei Bible School. We want to talk a little bit today about the condition that man was born in. Now, I, don't, I know it doesn't sound uh, very interesting, I don't know, maybe, uh, but I can tell you the content is mind-blowing, it really is. You can judge for yourself. And um, to find out the condition that man is born in, now by that I mean uh, the condition I was born in and you were born in, all people, since um, the fall of man into sin, according to Scripture. What was that condition? Now, we could say man was born in sin, and that is right, and it's true, and that's how it's described many times. But, but what is that sin? What is that, that let's call it an inbred uh, sinful condition? Give it, give it different words. Describe it in a different way um, to say, to try and, and get to the, the core of it. What is the actual condition? What is it that I was born when I was born many moons ago and I was a little innocent baby and there I was in the crib and wrapped in a blanket looking all beautiful and vulnerable and small. I had something within me, it was um, woven into my DNA, so to speak. And it's a condition that is regular or generally re referred to as, as sin. But what exactly was it? Now, to find out what exactly it was, we need to go to the first book of the Bible called Genesis, the third chapter. And that is the famous, or actually should say the infamous chapter, where uh, Satan enticed man uh, in the person of Adam and Eve, to rebel against God and he managed that and then there were consequences and the consequences um, that we will uh, uh, read now I mean, of the event that happened uh, takes the entire Bible to describe. So from Genesis chapter 3 right through to Revelation chapter 22 is what we see there summarized or encapsulated the consequences of what we're going to read in six verses in Genesis chapter 3. So this is what we get. I'm reading from the English Standard Version and it starts with verse 1 saying, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the women, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Those are the first, the first six verses, very famous uh, passage in Scripture, and this is where sin entered the human race. So let's just go over this passage slowly and just see what actually happened here. Now there are many things that we can lift out, many things that we can emphasize and you know, go into and, and expand on it and see you know, what, what is actually happening there and refer to many passages, other passages of Scripture, even in the New Testament, going to the writings of Paul, to Peter, James, John, maybe even the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and so forth. But we're not going to do that part. We're just going to um, highlight three factors, three interesting truths that, that happen here that will define this condition of sin I was born with or into. And so are you. So let's just look at what, the, what Satan told Eve in this conversation. He asked her 
did God actually say? Did he actually say? So he is asking her for a verbatim report on what did God say about this. So he said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now that part, of course, was not true. Satan knew this. He knew exactly what God told Adam and Eve. He knew exactly what his commands were. Exactly. But now he's, he's testing Eve. He's testing her. Did God actually say you can't eat of any of the trees here? Which gave her the opportunity to give testimony about the word of God and what God said, his command. So, she, which she did. She did it perfectly. She did it. It was a good job. She said, no, no, God said we can eat of all the trees except this one tree. Now, let me just tell you about trees and their fruit. Maybe it is with you as well, where you live, wherever that might be. But if you have a lemon tree, for instance, in your garden, one lemon tree, you know that that one lemon tree is more than sufficient, more than enough, providing more than enough lemons for, uh, for one household. I mean, a household consisting of a father and mother and maybe uh, two or three children, one lemon tree is more than suffice. Uh, to provide them with wonderful fruit for the year. And, and lemons you can use in anything. You can use it in water, in cold drink, in salad, in food, meat, fish. Any, you, you just name it. You can, you can add lemon juice to that, which is a wonderful tree to have. Uh, just, and that's just one lemon tree. Now, in this garden, Adam and Eve have, l let's say, a plantation of, of trees. Uh, from which they can choose. They can eat of all the fruit. There is, there is, well, to say there is more than enough is an absolute understatement. There is plenty for generations to eat from. If one tree is enough for an entire household, just think of this entire garden with all the trees, the thousands of trees that there might have been. They could eat of any of them. So God's provision to them was absolutely marvelous. There was, however, in all of these, all of this, there was one tree, just one tree that God said, do not eat. So Satan was asking, did God actually say you can't eat of any of the trees? And Eve said, no, 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 that's not what he said. She knew exactly what God said, exactly. She said, God said, we can eat of all the trees, just this one we might not eat. If we eat of this, or even touch it, we will die. So then, three things happen, and I want you, if you're following me uh, in your Bible, maybe uh, an actual copy of the Bible, or on your phone or computer, just, just read with me and see it for yourself, it's quite interesting. Uh, then, that would be verse mm, what verse is that just uh, probably three four i can't see my verses are not numbered so uh, it's more difficult it's where satan says but the serpent said to the women you will not surely die that's the first thing so the first thing satan tells eve is that the word of god is not true that's the first thing you must see this it's the first of a trilogy First one, God's word is not true. Look at the second one, he tells her. He says, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like him, knowing good and evil. So the second thing is actually inferring. He's inferring with the second point and saying, you think God wants you to steer away from this tree, not knowing sin, because perhaps you think he loves you. He gives you all these trees, thousands of trees, but just this one, there's a prohibition, a command not to touch this one. And you think it's because he loves you. But the actual reason is he's not trying to love you and protect you, He's suppressing you. And, and the, the second point that he infers there is God's 
character is not trustworthy. So the first thing he said was God's word is not true. He said you will die, you will not die. His word is not true. And flowing from that, of course, the next thing would be there is this, this motion of distrust. Is that what you call it in English? Is this the shadow he casts on the character of God. He is not trustworthy. Now, the most interesting thing here is that Satan knows that the number one character trait of God is that he is holy. So what he's actually doing here is attacking the holiness of God when he says he is not trustworthy. In other words, there's something in God that is, that is evil and that is unclean and impure and not holy. His character is not to be trusted. His word is not to be trusted. His character is not to be trusted. And then he makes the move for the third point. So it's the same wording there. He says, For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the third thing is an actual encouragement to Eve to eat of this tree, to break free. I want to break free, as the song went in the 80s. I want to break free. Just break free of the oppression that God uh, laid on you. Just break free and realize yourself. Reach for the stars. He does not want you to become like Him. He does not want competition. And, but He knows that if you do eat of this tree, you will be like Him. So break free from the oppression. Don't listen to his word, it's lies. His word is not true. His character is not to be trusted. And you can realize yourself. In other words, if there is a God and it is you. And incidentally, it says there, and then Eve saw that the fruit was good to eat. The tree was attractive suddenly. Now, we're not going into this part to analyze and see what did Eve see when she looked at the fruit after this. But those three things, let's just pause on them for a while. God's word is not true. His character is untrustworthy. And you can be your own God. That is what we were born with. It's called sin. That is what it is. That's the definition of it. My word is true. I am trustworthy. I am the standard of what is right and wrong. And I will be my own God. We were born with that. And it manifested in our lives from the very beginning. I will decide what to do. I will decide what is right and wrong. And in, in modern politics it's very evident. You know, my feelings, my interests, my viewpoint, my world view, my identity. That is what it's all about. That is why God's wrath, God's judgment rests on man. Man who is a created being, created by God. Man who has a definite beginning. God who has no beginning, who always was. God who created man. Man elevating himself to the position of the Creator. Saying, God is a liar. God is untrustworthy. And I can realize my own life. I am in control. I will do as I please. I am my own boss. Denying God. And that incurs the judgment of God. And that is exactly where Satan wants Adam and Eve. Does Satan know God's word is true? Yes. Does he know 
God's character is trustworthy. Oh yes, he banks on it. He knows God is holy. He knows that God will just everything that is unholy and impure. He knows that. Does he know there is only one God, and that is the God who created heavens and earth, the heavens and the earth? Yes, he knows that more than any other creature or being. He knows that. So why does he lie to Adam and Eve in such a way? Well, for one reason only, he wants them to turn against God because he wants uh, God's wrath on their lives. He knows that will destroy them. God's wrath will destroy them in a way that he never will be able to do. He can only do what he's permitted to do, but God's wrath will separate them from the presence of God for eternity. And that's where he wants them, exactly there, because that's where he's heading. Now, right through Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, this revelation, this picture, this truth unfolds progressively until we see it in Revelation, we see it in its full glory, so to speak, in the depth of it, what it means, what it entails, the weight of it. I was born uh, an enemy of God. I was born with every fiber of my being, every part of me, the very DNA of my existence, rebelling against God, rebelling against His Word, against His character, and against His position, elevating myself to Him. And you know, you, you, you do not only see this in the world, you know, the world of sin and the world who doesn't care about God's authority and God's Word, you also see this in the church. I mean, in the church even, People are still striving to be in control, to be gods themselves. That's why I'm much more, much more interested in hearing what God can give me to aid me in this journey of becoming God than what I am interested in what He has to say, what it will cost me that I lay down my life, that I die and He lives. That's the part I'm not interested in. I am very much invested in hearing prophecies and so-called truths about God uh, confirming, fixing my position as His equal. Because it's embedded in me that there is a God and it is I. My word is true. My word is final. Whenever there is a situation and, and I need to make a choice of some sort, my word, my viewpoint, my interests, those are the determining factors, not God's. And when things are going downhill for me, I'm very quick to say, I thought he's a God of love. And if he is a God of love, why does this happen? It's still embedded there. His character is untrustworthy, you see. This is a deep thing. And you know what is marvelous about the work and person of Christ and the gospel? Is that Jesus, who is the perfect revelation of who God is, came to reveal that God's word is true that God's character is absolutely trustworthy. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He is also merciful. And it is Jesus who came to reveal that there is a God. And it is not you or I. He is the image of the unseen God. Nobody has ever seen God, John 1 verse 18. But he who is in the bosom of the Father, he made him known. And that is what salvation is all about. I'm not repenting of, and let me use the word, petty sins. I'm not merely repenting of um, stealing and adultery and lying. I mean, 
those things are bad enough, but, but they are not, nothing in comparison with the origin of those things. And the origin of those things is the fact that I am God's enemy, that I rebel against Him, that I nullify His word, that I deny His character and deny His position and elevate myself to being God myself. Those things that I just mentioned, the, the stealing and the lying and the adultery and the murder and the, you know, whatever you can mention as part of that list, it's just the outflow of the real thing. The real thing is, I am the authority in my life. I decide. And that will drive me like a golf ball. It will drive me across the range straight to the wrath of God and the destruction of who I am. To be separated from Him for eternity. And that is exactly what Satan wants. So, during Jesus' ministry, He told the people, He said, that's exactly where you're going. <laughs> he said, that's exactly where you're going. You're going to damnation. You will be judged. You will be destroyed. You will bear the consequences of your, your enmity and your rebellion against God. You will. That's, that's guaranteed where you're heading. I just want to tell you, there is a way out. And the way out, you need to hear this because this is important. The way out is not only an escape from God's wrath. It is deliverance from that that is within you that drives you to God's judgment. And the thing that is within you that drives you to God, God's judgment is the fact that you think you are God. The fact that you think God's word is not true and that his character is not trustworthy deeply embedded and you need deliverance from that it's not you know uh, uh, it's not a moral ex merely a moral exercise of where you try to be better you try to be a better person no 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 you will fail guaranteed you will fail what you need is a savior you need somebody that can grab you by the collar and pluck you out of the raging river it is a force within you that will drive you deliberately to the wrath of God and eternal damnation. I need to be delivered from that. The inward um, position of being an enemy of God. I need to be grabbed, rescued from this position and placed into a different position where instead of being an enemy of God, I am a friend of God. Where instead of living a life of absolute rebellion and disobedience against God, living a life of absolute obedience and subjection to His authority, a position where I worship myself as God to a place where I worship Him as God realizing that I was made to worship at His feet. I was made to serve Him. I was made for Him. Delivered and saved from being an enemy of God, placed into the family of God, and therefore also delivered and saved from the judgment of God, and placed into the grace of God. The road between these two worlds is a person. It's called Jesus Christ, the beloved Son of God. And the only way that I can get out of this world of, of being an enemy of God and incurring the judgment of God out is to believe in Jesus as my Lord, my Master, and therefore my Savior. And through Him, I'm taken out of this world and placed into this one. 
the, Paul, Paul's words were, I was, I have to freely translate from the Afrikaans now. I was taken from the kingdom of darkness, taken, plucked from darkness and placed into the kingdom of God's Son, whom He loves. Where I bow my knees and worship Him, saying, Your word is true. Your character is trustworthy. doesn't matter what happens to me or to the world. You are who you said you are. And there is a God and it's not me. There is a God and it's not me. What a place to be. Those two worlds are the absolute opposites, uh, opposites of the spectrum. The North and the South Pole of life. You were born a rebel against God. Even if you live a fairly good life, acceptable according to society, you're still the enemy of God. You still incur the judgment of God. Even though you, you help out in Africa, working in orphanages, donating money here, you know, not killing and not stealing too much or lying. I mean, things that you think will separate you from most people in society. Even then, you're still an enemy of God. You need the deliverance of God that comes in Christ Jesus. Now that's, a, that's the next step. Now, I just want to, in conclusion, just say, whenever in the New Testament the disciples of Jesus preached this, what you just heard, maybe in less words than I use now, but whenever they preached this, there was a reaction among the people. And I can think of, of two incidences immediately. The one in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. The other one is Acts chapter 16. The one being the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter preaching. The other one in a town called Philippi. And uh, Paul and Silas, they were thrown into jail and they were tortured somewhat. And then there was an earthquake and wonderful things happened. And the jailer asked them, what must I do to be saved? In, in Acts chapter 2, the people in Jerusalem asked Peter after hearing this. They said, what must I do to be saved? And in, in both those in instances, both those times, Peter, Paul and Silas did not answer them with, there's nothing you can do. Just accept what Jesus did. Not once. In both those instances they said, turn to the Lord Jesus. Admit the fact that you are God's enemy. And ask Him for mercy. Now, that's my summary of what they said. They said it in different words. We can look at it in a different video perhaps. But this is important for you to realize. I may be of a different culture than you. I speak a different language than you. I was brought up in a different way than you. But on this level, you and I are exactly the same. We were born enemies of God. But there is a way out, if you want it.